you know, one of the things that, that I love when we go out on tour is you, you see things that you've seen before, but maybe you haven't looked at them the way that, that you have on a recent trip. And, and the reason why I say that is Scott Pierce sees irons, Tursky. Yes. We've, we've seen them before. <laughs> we've seen the woods. They're covered in lead tape, but you did something different this time. You went through the bag and you took photos. And I think this is, this is kind of cool because we're not just going to be like gushing over the fact that, that Piercy has lead tape all over his clubs, but like, there's a purpose. You talk to JJ at Titleist, there's a purpose kind of behind the locations and what he's trying to do here. Yeah. So we all know that lead tape looks really cool on irons and drivers and wedges and putters. I think it just aesthetically, it looks cool, but for the most part, I don't know if we all know exactly where to place it. So I got to hold Piercy's clubs, get photos of them, go through. And I asked him, he does put lead tape on the clubs himself. He's got his own little workshop at his house. He does it himself. Um, so he said he aims for D4 swing weight through the bag. Now, Chris, you're looking at the photos of the clubs, right? Mm -hmm. How much lead tape would you say is on the irons in terms of weight? How much weight do you think he's adding? Oh, let me get over to the iron here. It's, I mean, that's, that's an aggressive tape job. I mean, he has to be bumping that a couple of swing weight points at least as he plays. Yeah, I would guess that he's probably looking at at least two points, maybe three or more worth of tape on the heads of the irons alone. How much? How much? I was looking at some of your you images. Bump it up a swing weight point, Chris. To go up one swing well, point, how much lead tape? Depending upon the lead tape you're using, I mean, every two grams that we add in the head is going to be bumping it up a swing weight point. So, I mean, you can get the the dual density, uh, you can get the the thick strips or the thin strips. So, it just kind of depends on the type of lead tape that you're using. But every two grams that you're adding to that head is is a swing weight point. And like we talked about, I mean, swing weight is essentially an arbitrary measurement just allowing the player to feel the club head more through the swing so i mean for scott as he's adding this lead tape and trying to get to that d4 swing weight that's the determination that he's made as far as his feel is concerned with where he can feel that club head through the duration of the swing and i also happen to know that he has mid-size golf pride toy velvet <laughs> cord grips and he chops off uh, i think it's half inch on each iron so how does that kind of play into placing lead tape on a club and how does that affect swing weight? Now, if he's going under length and for the majority of us out there that are in the kind of club industry, if you're removing a half inch of length, that equates to around that three swing weight points uh, removal from the, the overall feel of that club when you're swinging it. And then you take a half inch off and add a mid-size grip now you're effectively pulling more swing weight out of the club head. So yeah, he's got, he's got quite a bit of tape on the, uh, on the actual club head itself. If he's getting it back up to a D four as if there was no tape on there, he would absolutely be down into that C category for swing weight. And where he's placing it on the irons, what is that doing to center of gravity and like swing dynamics? So with where he has it on his particular irons with it being, more of that blade style profile. He's got it, uh, it basically where the meat of the iron is. So he's, he's keeping that CG a little bit lower, uh, doesn't have it up over that center line. So he's still keeping the CG a little bit low. Uh, it looks like, at least on the irons, it's kind of just in a, a neutral spot, not really manipulating CG too much. Uh, wedges are a little bit different story. At uh, iron, I would say CG is probably still going to be lowest center. Just from what I can tell in the pictures. Is that going to make them more forgiving? Just like straight up putting more weight into the club head? I mean, not necessarily more forgiving. I mean, if you start putting weight really low and towards the perimeter, towards the toe, towards the heel, uh, that's where you start getting a little bit more forgiveness in the head. 
I mean, one solid forged piece of steel and this blade type of iron, it's already not forgiving, as we've talked about numerous times before. Yeah. But I mean, just kind of putting the lead tape all over the back of the, the bottom two thirds of the iron, not really adding a lot of forgiveness. It is going to help to get that ball airborne a little bit. But as far as missing it on the toe or on the heel, ugh, there's still not a lot of forgiveness there for sure. <laughs> 680s are the classics, but not necessarily the most forgiving irons of all time. No, that's uh, that falls in that category of not what I would uh, recommend for too many people out there. Okay, so let's check out this wedge now. <clears throat> First of all, shout out to Piercy for still rocking the SM4s. SM4s, yeah. Yeah, those are great. Say, that's that's a, that's a, I, Would you call it a classic wedge now? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, SM8 is at the end of the life cycle, so we're getting ready to transition. I mean, I, I feel like we have more than doubled the uh, the generation of this SM4 that he's playing. So, yeah, I'd, I'd put that in the, in the classic configuration. So as you look at the 56 degree, he's got the lead tape low on the back of the club. And then as you look at the 60 degree, he's got the lead tape high. So what's that kind of going to do to CG manipulation and performance in general? So CG on the, the SM8 uh, looks like he's just kind of added a little bit more to that already thicker upper portion of the wedge. So he's definitely looking to to pull that CG up so that he can hit those kind of flighted lower knockdown wedge shots with that 60 degree. And scrolling back over to the, the 56, that's kind of in a neutral position, really. I mean, it's a little higher than what we saw in the irons, but it's not to the uh, not to the extreme of what he did to that 60. That 60 looks like it has just layers and layers and layers of lead tape on it. <clears throat> that would be an interesting one to to hit and see what that ball flight's like. So that's going to come out low like and more it has some, some manipulation too to the to the grind there on the backside. Looks a little yeah. Out, outside of standards, so probably remove, removing of weight. Maybe that's why it's a bit more centralized on that. Mm -hmm. Just to guess. That's what I would kind of assume. It looks like yeah, he's got some some trailing edge relief and some heel relief uh, on that 56, and it's stamped at 57. See, I look like he may have just taken a little bit of bounce off of that trailing edge and down towards the heel. So what is trailing edge relief going to do? I feel like people kind of get confused with, like, why does turf interaction even matter? if you're clipping the ball first, you know what I mean? Well, it kind of depends on how you use your wedge. So, I mean, if you're cambering the club forward or cambering the club back, opening the phase versus hooding it to hit more of a knockdown, you know, how you have your hands in relationship to the leading edge through impact. So there's, there's a variety of different shots that you can hit based upon the types of bounces and grinds that you play and also how you release the club into the turf and get through the turf. So if you're somebody that uh, you see a lot of players that are very handsy with their wedges versus somebody that likes to grab the handle and kind of drag it left as they rotate. So those guys that get that leading edge into the turf early versus somebody that's kind of a sweeper picker grinds and bounces are going to vary. So, I mean, it, it really just depends on style technique and also the type of turf you're playing on. You know, firm and fast ground versus soft and very sandy or rocky even. So I want to get into the driver and the three wood now because it's pretty interesting. So he's got lead tape on his driver on the heel portion. And then he's got a sure fit setting of C2. <clears throat> then on the three wood, he's got it on the toe portion with a sure fit setting of D1. Now this could definitely be confusing. Can you try to break down exactly what you think uh, he might be doing here. So let's get into that. We're not going to talk driver. about the, uh, the lead tape residue. That's that's on that head all over the heel. <laughs> I know. All over. It's the heel. great. <clears throat> that, that's so, yeah, what he... was cool about getting these clubs in hand. You can kind of pick up some of that stuff. You know, when you look on Getty, it just looks like, uh, you know, one little piece of tape up there, but there's more going on in that head. He likes playing. Looks like he wasn't weight. totally sold on the uh, old lead tape location. Yeah, right. Because it was, it would look like it was way more heel word. This one looks a bit more. I mean, still, he, still heel word, but but kind of more towards the center. On the, oh, with uh, the C two setting on there, it's it's interesting that 
he's got it in more of a an upright setting taken with c2 going to be 0.75 degrees aloft off of the uh, static loft and then uh, 0.75 upright from the the standard line on the c2 setting if i remember correctly let me just yeah just wanted to double check myself there and then yeah, he had a bunch of lead tape down towards the heel, and he shifted it back a little bit more towards neutral, slightly heel bias location there. So it looks like he's doing just about everything that he can to still get this, what you would characteristically call a fade bias driver to, to turn over a little bit for him. How does that help? With the the lead so tape placement, yeah. Let's say you you have a fade bias driver, and then you put lead tape in the heel. Like, who is a player that would benefit from doing something like that? I would say most of us would benefit if you're somebody that misses to the right. I wouldn't buy a fade bias driver and right. then then just lead tape the heel and hope for the best. <laughs> uh, but I mean, for for Scott, he probably likes the look at address of that very neutral to open face but still likes to be able to move that ball right to left, which is, which is kind of counterintuitive to the design. But if you're able to shift that CG just a little bit more towards the heel with the addition of all that extra weight and help that toe release a little faster, it probably will help him in particular bring the club face back to square, if not turn it over a little easier to hit that right to left draw. But then he has lead tape on the toe of his fairway wood. Right. What's, what's going on here? So let me get back to that picture. So we go from TSI four to TSI two, a much different design as far as just the engineering in the head. So, and he's got a D one setting on that, which D one, he he's at that standard lie angle, but uh, taking that 0.75 off on the loft, and now he has a TSI two head, which is going to be that more neutral to slightly draw bias design and putting weight out towards the toe. So I would assume uh, looking to prevent a left miss or keep that ball flight relatively stable, adding the, uh, adding the weight out on the toe because that TSI two does have a tendency to be a little bit more on the draw bias side relative to uh, the TSI four for sure. So in terms of a more general question, <clears throat> what are some mistakes that you see amateurs make with lead tape? Like when guys bring sets into you and you're like, what are you, what are you thinking here with the lead tape? They probably put it everywhere. <clears throat> I, I, they do. Yeah. They, they will, uh, they will just pack it everywhere and it, it really kind of comes down to as you start your Q&A and interview process with the with the client that's coming in with said lead tape everywhere. It's what was the objective? What were you trying to do? What do you see that the club is not doing? And a lot of times they'll, specifically in irons, they'll pack a ton of lead weight out towards the toe and then they miss it right. And they're not necessarily putting two and two together of, okay, I have, I've now repositioned and and put discretionary weight in a different part of the golf club from where it was originally designed and changed the characteristic of it. So they're trying to fight something that they've inadvertently done and can't figure out why they think that, okay, I'm adding weight to this golf club to get a better feel or to improve that, that swing weight feel. And then at the same time, they're also changing some of the characteristics of how that club's designed to perform. And when you're just packing it out towards the toe, yeah, you're bumping the swing weight. Yes, you can feel the head more, but you're also slowing down the release of that head. You're potentially moving CG placement depending upon how much weight you're adding to the head. So there's there's quite a few things that you, you'll you see uh, some players do with lead tape application. Can lead tape ever be placed on a shaft to change the performance of a club? I mean, can it be placed on a shaft? Well, I know yes. it can. I know it sticks. <laughs> it definitely sticks, but... You know, is it ever helpful? Uh, and some people will actually counterbalance their club. So you'll see sometimes players that play something that's very long where 
swing weight, for example, gets just too much for them to handle and it feels like they're swinging a sledgehammer, you'll actually have players that will wrap lead tape underneath the handle of the club or underneath the grip of the club just to pull a little bit more weight out of the head so it gets to be more manageable than what would feel like swinging a, a 20 pound sledge. So can it be done? Yes. Is it common practice? Not necessarily, but I mean, you can move weight around a golf club. I mean, there's some people that like the feel of a standard size grip and they play an inch over and there's only a couple ways that you can pull that head weight out. And that's, you know, you can add weight plugs underneath the grip or the, uh, the poor man's fix is, uh, is wrapping lead tape and, then putting your double-sided tape over the lead tape and calling it a day. I like poor man's fixes. Makes it fun. Uh, who, who doesn't? <laughs> well, I think that was uh, lead tape 101 with Chris McCormick right there. Thank you, Chris. Oh, absolutely. You can, you can have all kinds of fun with lead tape, but it'll, it'll get you in trouble if you don't know what you're doing. But... Exactly. That, that was me when I was a kid. I just liked the fact that lead tape existed and I could put it on golf clubs. And I totally like put it everywhere it was it was not good the first time i saw like a tour player use yeah the first time i saw a tour player use lead tape i was like i'm sticking this stuff everywhere like i gotta pick this stuff up now let's go to golf smith absolutely usually usually a pretty good uh rule of thumb that you you don't want to play cash games or uh or wager with people that have a lot of lead tape strategically placed all over their equipment yeah exactly 